بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما ثنيت على نفسك اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اجعله خالصا لوجهك الكريم لا ابتغاء سمعة ولا شهرة ولا رياء أما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إن شاء الله you are all well and إن شاء الله تعالى you and your families are well and healthy إن شاء الله تعالى and in a good state of iman إن شاء الله تعالى uh, Last week we looked at some of the difficulties and the challenges the early converts, because that's what they were really, they were early converts to Islam, converts or reverts, whichever word you are comfortable with. But they were people who were in Jahiliya, they were invited to Islam, they accepted the message of Islam, so they converted to Islam, and they suffered tremendously. And in many of these stories that we see, there are lot, many lessons for us born Muslims, but for the convert brothers and sisters. And we will highlight some of those important lessons inshallah ta'ala as we go. But we look particularly at the amazing and sad at the same time story of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu if you recall. You all remember the story of Abu Bakr? Yes? You can nod. It's halal. Yes. So you remember the story of Abu Bakr. Uh, to you, what was the most amazing thing about the story of Abu Bakr? From, your, from what you recall, what was the, the most amazing thing do you think was about the story of Abu Bakr? Sorry? Yes, yes, yes. The inviting his mother to Islam. MashaAllah. Anyone else? For him, Prophet was the first one. Yes, motivation, Barakallah, his motivation, and the Prophet was number one for him. As soon as he opened his eyes, he asked about him. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Subhanallah, exactly. So Abu Bakr was there to, <clears throat> to offer himself for, on behalf of Rasulullah And many others, I'm sure you all have your own uh, your own reflections on the story of Abu Bakr. But absolutely, I think, for me, perhaps one of the most amazing things, <clears throat> and everything about Abu Bakr is amazing, <laughs> but uh, despite all the difficulties and the challenges, and the, despite the fact that he was beaten up so mercilessly, so badly, uh, he first asks about Rasulullah, which shows the love they had to for Rasulullah. Which, as you know, is a, a, a fundamental aspect of Iman. One cannot have Iman without loving Rasulullah more than he loves himself, his family, his husband, his, his, his her husband, his wife, his parents, his children. The love of Rasulullah should 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 be more than the love of anybody else that we have in our hearts. This is part of this is a fundamental part of Iman. And that's why later you will see when Umar radiallahu came comes to Rasulullah and he says, Wallahi inni la uhibbuka, he says, I swear by Allah I love you, O Messenger of Allah, more than anybody except myself. <laughs> because he was honest. He said, Except myself. Then Rasulullah says, You will not complete your Iman until I become more beloved to you than your own self. Imagine, which is, how do, you, how do you do that? It's very difficult. He says, Oh Rasulullah, I love you more than myself. He says, Now, Umar, now. So this love that they it wasn't an emotional type of love. Of course, that is wajib, that is necessary. The ulama say there are two types of muhabba for Rasulullah. There is two types of love that we must all have for Rasulullah. One is Hubb al Atifa. One is the sentimental, emotional type of love. And every Muslim has that. 
any Muslim, any Muslim who knows the basics of Islam has that hub al the love of emotions for Rasulullah. They say there's a, there was a Muslim who was in, in drunken in the in the bar, and somebody said something against Rasulullah. He he punched him. <laughs> he said, "Illa Rasul, don't say anything about Rasulullah sallam." This is hub al the love that everybody. This is the minimum love, and you see the Sahaba radiallahu anhu had that. And then a higher type of love is hub al ta'a. Rasulullah must lead you to obey him alayhi salatu wasalam in every aspect of our lives. The other aspect about Abu Bakr anhu was his concern for the hidayah of his mother. His concern for the hidayah of his own mother, the guidance of his own mother. And the minute there was an opportunity, and he was very wise about it, and this is what da'wah should be, is we have to be wise when we give da'wah. And they say a da'i should be like a, a doctor. He should diagnose the patient and give him the right dosage. An overdose would kill and underdose won't be effective. To find the right time, the right place, who should give da'wah, who should not give da'wah to the person. And Abu Bakr, he could have given da'wah to his, his mom. He could have, and he may have. But at that juncture, when she took him to Rasulullah Sallam, at that point, he said to Rasulullah Sallam, it's the, the circumstance was right. The circumstance was right. And this is hikmah. Hikmah wa shay fi mahallihi. Wisdom is to place a thing in its place, to, to put something in its place, in its rightful place. Hikmah is to do the right thing at the right time, in the right place. That's wisdom. At that moment, he says, O oh, Rasulullah, oh, Rasulullah Sallam, please make dua for my mother and invite her to Islam. The man is bruised, right? He's completely bruised. So Rasulullah Sallam makes dua for her and invites her and she accepts Islam. And you and I probably won't, will never be able to appreciate the, the happiness that was in the heart of our worker at the time. Unless especially born Muslims, we won't understand that. Unless you're a convert and you have been eager for your mom or dad to become Muslim and then they become Muslim, maybe that person would begin to feel the happiness that Abu Bakr had. Seriously. Right? And that's why born we, born Muslims, often we don't appreciate the stories of the Sahaba as much as the converts do. Because the challenges they go through, and we'll talk about some of them, the challenges they go through, go through sometimes are not so different to the challenges that these men and women went through. Rejection from their families, rejection from their community. They have to sometimes change their name, although it's, as you know, when somebody converts to Islam, if the name is fine, it is not a condition of conversion to Islam that they change their name. This is a adat that has become a habit among Muslims. The only time the name can be changed if the original name it has a bad meaning. Then it can be changed. But otherwise, uh, Michael and Joan and so forth, there is nothing wrong with that. Just as a footnote. Right, but they do, when they, they have to change the way they eat, they have to change the way they dress, they have to change their friends. These are the converts today, today, and the, therefore the challenges they face is, are tremendous. And sometimes we, the born Muslims, add to their challenges. We make it even more difficult for them. And we'll talk more about that, inshallah. So in that environment, you, want, you need to imagine the, 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 the time, you need to imagine the situation. Rasulullah sallallahu is still in the early phases of da'wah. He had kept it secret for a while and then opened it. And now the minute they declared their Islam, they were being persecuted and they were being beaten up. And those who were closest to him, especially those one who, did, who were slaves and did not have any backing. Makanhum dhahr. They didn't have a backing, somebody to back them up, some tribe or some person to back them up. Slaves. Or people who were traveling and happened to be in Mecca and their tribes weren't from Mecca. And so they didn't have any backup. So they suffered the most. They suffered the most. Or those who had no status in society at the time. I mean Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the only reason they stopped beating him is that because, because members of his tribe interfered. 
رضي الله عنه. And رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, الله عليه وسلم the only reason they although they tried to attack him many times but because he's from Quraysh. Quraysh, his uncle used to go and defend him صلى الله عليه وسلم. But others like Bilal رضي الله عنه had nobody. Bilal, as you know, was, they say, an Abyssinian slave of the worst type, of the worst type. And unfortunately, humans have a disease in their hearts. It's called racism, the disease of racism. It's a spiritual disease that if it's not, if it's not cleansed, it consumes this person. And this disease of racism, it manifests itself in different ways. Foremost is when a person looks at another who has a darker skin and thinks they are less than them. Sadly, this remained to be the case in the United States of America until very recently, legally. But the situation remains. I mean, you just saw last week the 18 year old man, and before that, he went into an old blacks area and just onto, onto a rampage and just shot so many blacks because simply they were blacks. Right? In Australia, the Aboriginal people were not even recognized as human beings because of their skin color. They weren't recognized. Even until today, they are not in the Constitution. Because of this racism, where a, cert, a, a, a certain race think they are more superior than another race. And Islam came to kill this disease. Because it's a disease of jahiliya. It's a disease of ignorance. And that's why you will see when later Bilal, after the Fath, when this same Bilal anhu, Rasulullah وسلم, asks him to climb the Kaaba and call Adam, some of those people who from Quraysh who still had disease in their hearts. They said a black man going on top of the Kaaba. That's when Nabi said, La farta wa la taqwa. There is no difference between Arab or non-Arab except in Taqwa. And there is no difference between white and black except in Taqwa. Allah Ta'ala doesn't look at the skin color. Right? And when one man tried to tease Bilal radiallahu anhu, a Sahabi mind you, to try to tease Bilal and he says, Ya bin Umm Sauda. He says, You are the, the son of the black mother. And Rasulullah heard that. So he said to him, You are a man in, whose, in whom there is jahiliya. There is jahiliya in you. There is ignorance in you. And if you it's, leave it, it's, it stinks. And if you die with that jahiliya, you die <coughs> on, on a branch of kufr. May Allah save us. So the man then laid down on the floor, he put his face on the floor and said to Bilal, step on my face to teach me a lesson. So, some, this is, so the racism was very, very rampant at the time. And unfortunately it continues. Unfortunately. Islam came to eliminate that racism, but even among us Muslims we still have that racism. Maybe if not on skin color, on nationalities. The Muslim, the Pakistani Muslim, and the Indian Muslim, and the Palestinian Muslim, and the Jordanian Muslim, and the Lebanese Muslim, the Syrian Muslim, and and this is a, a double disease that the Western powers, the colonialists, brought into our countries when they superficially divided our countries. They created these superficial boundaries and created these nationalities. Before the colonial powers, Muslims could travel anywhere in the Islamic Empire under the Ottoman Khilafah without needing a visa or a passport. His passport and his visa was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. When to divide the Muslims, they introduced these artificial boundaries and nationalities. And made us feel, made one nationality feel better than, better than the other. This is, this is a huge problem. And it's another disease on top of racism, nationalism. That's another disease. Being patriotic, loving one's nation, there is nothing wrong with that. To love your nation, there's nothing wrong with that. To love Australia is nothing wrong with that. To love a nation is a sunnah. Rasulullah loved Mecca. When he was leaving it, he looked back and he cried and he says, Wallahi, I love you. To love a nation, there is nothing wrong with it. That's called patriotic, being patriotic.
But being nationalistic is a problem. Nationalism is a problem. When you think your nation or your race or your people are the best or better than anybody else, that is a problem. So Bilal was in that, in that, in that environment of very strong form of racism that enslaved those people who were darker in color. And he was of the, of the worst type, supposedly. Now, he was completely owned by somebody else. In other words, he had no value in society. He was simply a number. Bilal, before Islam, was simply a number. He could only eat when his master tells him. He sleeps when his master tells him. He works as his master tells him. And they whip him when they want. He was perhaps in their eyes less than the horse that they were riding. But then the message of Islam rang in his ear. He heard that there is somebody who is inviting to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And the beauty of that message and the power of that message and the attraction of that message drew his heart. Without thinking of the consequences of what they will do to him, he decided to take Islam. Why? Because this is when, well, this is when Iman penetrates the heart. You, you don't think anymore of any, anything else but the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. When it penetrates the, the heart. Bilal radiallahu anhu was, he became Muslim and was of the very early ones. In fact, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, awwal man adhar al-Islam sab'a. Ibn Mas'ud says the first people who openly declared they were Muslim were seven people. Abu Bakr, Ammar, Ummuhu Sumayya and his mother Sumayya, and Suhayb, Bilal, and Miqdad, and Rasulullah sallallahu Now Bilal, and of course everybody knows the story of Bilal. Bilal when he decided to, uh, when he accepted Islam, his master, in fact, Bilal was the master. He was the master. But Umayyah bin Khalaf. Umayyah bin Khalaf was so angry at the fact that at the fact, at the fact that the slave Bilal accepted Islam without his permission. That is what made him angry. Because he doesn't he cannot eat or drink or sleep without the permission of the master. And now you have changed your faith without my permission. So Bilal uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf is decides to speak to Bilal to change his faith, to, to renounce Islam, to leave Islam. And Bilal says, no way. So Umayyah calls the, the young people of, of, of Mecca and says, take his, short, take his shirt off and drag him. And they used to first, they used to put uh, uh, metal chains on them knock them onto the ground and then drag him in the very hot sand of Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Bilal at that moment such strength that all he could say was Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. Allah is one, 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 Allah is one. When they realized that this type of torture was not used, was not uh, make, take, uh, making him return away from Islam, so they, 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 they increased the torture. They laid him on, on his back and they put a big rock on him and they would whip him and whip him and whip him and when they get tired they'll, they'll change hands and somebody else come and whip and whip him. And all Bilal could say is Ahad al Ahad. No food, no water. Nobody there to help him. But he knew that because there is nobody there that, that, that can help me, he turned to the one who can only help him. Ahadun Ahad. Allah, Allah. Later on when they asked Bilal, how, how did you tolerate the punishment? How? Nowadays, excuse me Ali, for saying this, nowadays if we have a little migraine, we don't come to the masjid. Too, too difficult, right? They say the Sahaba when they used to be unwell, as long as, long as it's not contagious, right? <laughs> if it's contagious, don't come. <laughs> they said they, 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 he would support on himself on two men to go to the masjid. 
just to make it to the masjid. Right? So they asked Bilal, how, how is it that you resisted all this difficult punishment? And he said something absolutely beautiful. He said, the sweetness of Iman was mixed with the sweetness of punishment and torture. And the sweetness of Iman overcome the sweet, the, the, sorry, the sweetness of Iman was mixed with the bitterness of the torture. And so the sweetness of Iman overcome the bitterness of torture. So Allah gave me the tawfiq to say Ahad on Ahad. And as I said in the past, the ulama say, Bilal was the mu'adhan of this dunya and the heavens. When Bilal called Adhan, not only the humans around him listened, but the malaika also listened. Bilal radiallahu anhu. So, as Umayyah bin Khalaf was torturing Bilal radiallahu anhu, now we can say radiallahu anhu, I mean how lucky he was. Can anyone here today claim to be better than Bilal? Of course not. You know what the ulama say? There can be no alim, regardless of how great he was. No alim, and no hafid, and no qari, and no mujahid, after the sahaba. Nobody can, out of all of them, can be equal to Bilal. Forget us. Because these, these were men and women who saw Rasulullah and believed in him, and they, they were persecuted for him, alayhi salatu They were chosen by Allah, deliberately. And so, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes to the rescue. And you begin to realize, well, as you hear more about Abu Bakr radiallahu and inshallah, if Allah gives us tawfiq, we finish the seerah, we can do the seerah of Abu Bakr if you want. The more you hear about Abu Bakr, the more you realize, that's why Abu Bakr was the man who he was. Abu Bakr, his, one of his jobs that he took upon himself is to go around and look for those slaves who have no support and purchase their freedom. No matter how much it cost, he was ready to give. And Bilal was one of those people. When he went to Umayyah bin Khalaf, <coughs> he said to him, he said this to him, أَلَا تَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي هَذَا الْمِسْكِينَ Won't you fear? Abu Bakr says to Umayyah, Umayyah bin Khalaf, fear Allah in regards to this miskin, this poor man. Fear Allah. What does he respond to him, Umayyah? He says, أَنْتَ الَّذِي أَفْسَدْتَهُ فَأَنْقِذْهُ مِمَّا تَرَى You are the one who spoiled him. Umayyah says to Abu Bakr, you made him rebel against us. By him becoming Muslim, you made him rebel against our traditions <clears throat> and our beliefs. So you save him. He said, I will save him. How much you want for him? And they negotiated a price until Umayyah bin Khalaf was happy with 40 uqiyah of gold. The uqiyah of gold is about 30 grams of gold. So it's about 120 grams of gold, right? <clears throat> that he said, yes, you can take it. And then, then Umayyah, after he released Bilal, he says, Wallahi, he says to Abu Bakr, if you gave me less, I would have given him to you. And Abu Bakr says, Wallahi, if you asked much more, I would have given it to you. Bilal radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Now Bilal continues to suffer after that, but he becomes so beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such that, as it comes in this high hadith, one day Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he continued to be the companion of Rasulullah I mean that alone is a massive, massive bounty. How much better can it get when you happen to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Bilal, Oh Bilal, what is it that you do that made me sami'tu khashafan alayka bayna yadayya fil jannah? Bayna yadayya ani amami. He says, what may, what is it that you do, O oh Bilal? Because I, I heard last night, I heard the sound of your shoes right in front of me in, in Jannah. Meaning you were walking in front of me in Jannah, O oh Bilal. <laughs> he says, Oh Rasulullah, 
I don't know, it's not much, but perhaps it is every time I make wudu, I go and pray to rak'at. Bilal radiallahu anhu was so much beloved to Rasulullah sallam that it is said that Rasulullah sallam died radin an Bilal. When Rasulullah sallam died, he was pleased with Bilal radiallahu anhu. So here is a man who was nothing in the society and because of the beauty of Iman, suddenly he becomes something in the eyes of Allah. Forget the society, who cares what the society says? As long as you are known to Allah, as long as you are worthy in the eyes of Allah, that's what matters. That's what matters. Sometimes we, we get dragged into this false assumption that we need to be known in society. What if people don't know me? I need to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with that about driving nice cars and wearing beautiful clothes. That's a ni'mah. If you, Allah, you can, if Allah Ta'ala has given you this ni'mah, there is nothing wrong with that. But if the intention is so that people can notice, that is a problem. Who cares if people notice you or not? <clears throat> And who cares if people acknowledge you or not? As long as Allah Ta'ala notices, and as long as Allah Ta'ala acknowledges, that's what matters. That's what matters. And so that's what, that's what it was. Bilal who was in the eyes of his society, nothing, a number only. When he was connected with Allah Ta'ala, look how Allah elevated him. It's Allah who elevated him. And what greater task can be, then be the one then of Rasulullah And it was Rasulullah who said, let Bilal call the Adhan because he has a beautiful voice. So Abu Bakr عنه, continues to go around and buy slaves and in free them. With his own money, he used to go and do that. And because of his generosity, Allah Ta'ala reveals Verses, and this happens few times in the Quran, in this case in Surah Al Layl from verses 5 to 21, Allah Ta'ala reveals ayat of the Quran about Abu Bakr anhu. and people who do the act of Abu Bakr. Allah Ta'ala revealed ayat as for the one who gave, who gives and has taqwa. وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَةِ And he believes in the hereafter. That Allah said, this is in reference to Abu Bakr. فَسَنُوا يَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَةِ We will make his path to that Jannah very easy. Very easy, Allah says about Allah. Allah will make his path very easy. رضي الله عنه And we will hear more about Abu Bakr as we go because Abu Bakr plays a central figure in the seerah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. But at the same time, the other people who were being punished and persecuted, the other new converts, were the Ammar uh, bin Yasir and his mother and his father. Now Ammar, <coughs> uh, uh, the father of Ammar, uh, migrated to Mecca some time ago with another brother of his called Al-Harith and Malik. Two more brothers, Harith and Malik, migrated with uh, Ammar's father but those two went back and Ammar stayed there so he wasn't a local of Mecca <clears throat> and he wasn't a slave either but he was under the, the he was a mawla meaning he was like a servant who had some more freedom than the slaves but not so much that he can defend himself or can have backup if he need, need it that's why when they also Ammar and Sumayya radiyallahu anha and, and the, the father uh, became Muslim also they were persecuted actually very very savagely. Sumayya bint Khayyat radiyallahu anha uh, when, when they became uh, Muslim uh, they were persecuted in such a way that they used to be tied up in the very hot sun and they were deprived of food and water, the three. You imagine the father, the mother, and the son. It is very, very difficult. 
And Rasulullah could not do, could not help them because they weren't slaves where Abu Bakr could not even buy their freedom. So they were in, in a lingering situation where you couldn't buy their freedom but they didn't have tribal backup. So the best that Rasulullah could do for them at the time was to come and visit them and say to them, Sabran ala Yasir inna ma'ilakum al Jannah. Just have patience, O family of Yasir, because your promise is Jannah. And then in another hadith, غفر الله لكم وقد غفر. He says, may Allah forgive you, and he has. Rasulullah said to them, and I mean, if you and I, we, we were in that situation, and it was Rasulullah who is consoling you, and says, you have been forgiven, and your promise is Jannah. Inshallah, that would give them the impetus and the strength to continue to, to persevere. Because there is a higher purpose that they're looking to for, and that is Jannah. They were, I mean, remember the story of <clears throat> the story of the woman who gave the dog water. You remember that story, and you know the hadith after she gave the dog water, and she was a woman who was committing some major sin. In some narration, it's a man, so it's not because she's a woman, but in some narration, it was a man, and they, she saw or he saw the dog that was panting. And then after that, she gave, or he gave the dog water. What did Allah Ta'ala say to this person? What did Allah, how did he reward her? Huh? Ah, Allah said in one hadith, Shakar Allah laha. First Allah thanked her. Now just remember, this is a dog. Allah said thank you. وَغَفَرَ لَهَا and forgave her. وَأُدْخِرَةِ الْجَنَّةِ In some narration, she was made to enter Jannah. Why? she showed mercy to an animal, one of Allah's creations. When the ulama read this hadith, they say, we wish we were that woman. Why? Because she was forgiven. Yes, she was given. We know she's going to Jannah. You and I, we don't know yet. <laughs> Allahu A'lam. <laughs> but she was. Now this is a woman the ulama, when they read this hadith, they say, we wish we were that woman. Now then imagine the situation when it's Rasulullah who's telling you, you have been forgiven and your promise is Jannah. Would you not then also say, we wish we were then? Right? And then, and because a person who has that deep conviction and the Iman has penetrated the heart so much, that all they can see is the Akhirah. And their qana'at, their conviction is on the promise of Allah and His Messenger. They know for certainty that a day will come on that day, as per the hadith, when Allah Ta'ala will bring the person who was most tortured in this dunya, but he was from the people of Iman. Imagine then if it was Sumayyah or Ammar or Bilal, and Allah Ta'ala brings him on the day of Qiyamah, and the hadith says, and he dips in one dip in Jannah. One dip, and then takes him out, and then he says, "Have you ever suffered in your life? Have you ever were you ever tortured in your life? Have you ever had migraines or headaches, or were you persecuted?" And they would say, "La wallahi ya Rabb, I, we swear by you, o our Lord, we've never felt pain in life. We've never been tortured in life. We've never had headaches. We've never had pain. Why? One dip it took. Just takes one dip, brothers and sisters. It takes one dip in Jannah to make you forget all the sufferings in this dunya." If a person has that yami, that iman and yaqeen, do you think he will not persist or she will not persist against the challenges that will come against them in this life? Of course they will. That is the beauty of iman. It gives people resilience and the capacity to be able to withstand the challenges of life. And that's why we feel sorry for people who don't have iman and they don't have yaqeen on the akhirah. Because when they face similar challenges that you and I may face, they don't have that resource to allow them to stand firm and believe there is something better coming in the hereafter. One in five farmers in Australia commit suicide. And suicide in, the, in Australia is one of the highest in the world, especially between young people, age 14 to 25. Why people, when they feel, I've got nothing else, I don't have anything. The farmer, when he loses his farm and the competition is too great and there is no income, and sometimes the farmers say it's cheaper 
to put all their produce in the bin than sell it. You know that? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. Sometimes it's... So when they have nothing and there is that, power is not there, that generator of Iman is not there, to say there is something better coming up in the hereafter. And to say that there's one dip in Jannah will make you forget all of this. When they feel that I have nothing, then they have only one choice, to take their lives. And we feel, have to feel, we have to feel sorry for them. We have to feel pity. And that's why the greatest thing that we have is that Iman. And that's what we need to be giving. That's what we need to be worried about. We need, we, people in this country don't want more money and they don't want more houses and they don't want more of this and that. They want something that is much better, which you and I have. And that's exactly what happened with Sumayya. When this Mal'oon, this person who was persecuting her, Abu Jahl came to Sumayya and said this to her. Imagine, this is a woman, and we know women are soft and gentle and fragile. Abu Jahl comes to this woman and he says, ما آمنت بمحمد إلا لأنك عشقت جماله عشقته لجماله She says, you know what? He says, this is my, I think you only believed in Muhammad because you loved Muhammad because he's very handsome. Because Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu was the handsome of all, the most beautiful of all. When you saw his, when you saw him, and we'll come later during the Hijrah, we will come and we will be told about his physical appearance. So we won't talk about it now, because we will we'll take it as it comes. We will see it was also another woman who gave us the first full description of the physical attributes of Rasulullah But for now, just let's stick with Sumayya. He says to her, I think you have become Muslim because you love Muhammad because of his beauty. And she was so insulted, so she she spoke harshly against him and spat in his face. She says, in other words, no, I became Muslim for Allah, not for anything else. Yes, Muhammad Sallallahu is beautiful, and he is the most beautiful, and he is the most handsome, alayhi salam, and no eyes lay on him but fall in love with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But she said, it's not because of wanting to marry him that I, I became Muslim, but it's for Allah. And this is an important point uh, for those who convert to Islam or those who converted to Islam. Like one, one British Muslim scholar who's also a convert to Islam in a conference to other converts or reverts, he said to them, if you became Muslim looking for an identity, they are British. He says, if you, came to, if you became Muslim looking for an identity, you came for the wrong reason. But if you came into Islam looking for Allah, then you have come for the right reason. Because you first, you must, and that's why people who marry somebody else become Muslim only to get married. And after that, they don't do anything about Islam. That's a problem. No, you first, you become Muslim for Allah because you, are, you want Allah. So Sumayya, that's exactly what she did. She says, no. And so she, she spat in her she spat in, in his face. So uh, Abu Jahl he then speared her with his spear. He speared her uh, uh, and killed her. And then they did the same thing to her husband. عنه, and so they were given the promise that Rasulullah gave, and that is Jannah. But can you imagine how difficult it was for, Am for Ammar radiallahu anhu to see his own mother and to see his father? Of course, what you need to realize and our sisters need to realize is that Sumayya was a badge of honor because she was the first shaheedah in Islam. The first ever person to become shaheed the first, anyone, it wasn't that Allah did not choose a man to become shaheed, the first shaheed. And there is everything be qadr, right? There is no chance, there is no coincidence, there is no accident. It's all qadr. 
it is Allah's qadr that he decided that the first shaheed or shaheedah is a woman. And you know the shaheed before the first drop of blood reaches the ground, they are completely forgiven. And you know that the shaheed would be given the highest level of jannah. It was a woman. As if to say, as if Allah Ta'ala is trying to tell us, this is how much I value the sacrifices and the iman of women. That if the first, and the word shaheed by the way, shaheed means what? Witness. Witness for what? Witness. A witness of Allah Ta'ala on this earth. A witness that Allah Ta'ala exists. A witness that Allah's promises are true. That's why the shaheed has a huge maqam, a huge station in the akhirah. And that's why the shaheed, as you know, in the battlefield, if a shaheed, he doesn't get washed. And his clothes don't, they just, they, they put him in the, his own clothes. Because when he, when he or she rises from the grave, the blood that was on them will be musk. And they would be raised with tahleel and talbiya and takbir. Sumayya radiyallahu anha. This is a role model. Sisters, our sisters want a role model. This is a role model. What sort of modeling she gave us? Persistence, iman, tawakkul in Allah Ta'ala, perseverance and patience and the highest levels of sacrifice as if to say to the women who are reading her story and of course the men as if it is to say to them you also need to sacrifice for this deed but your sacrifice will never be like mine and therefore no matter what difficulties you may face in the cause of deen be patient and remember as if Sumayya is saying to the women remember my sisters that Rasulullah promised us maghfirah, forgiveness and jannah for the patience and perseverance that I had and my son and my husband and the same could be for you also. This type of role model you want, a person who truly stood for what they believed in, a woman who truly stood and persisted and resisted the highest forms of oppression and aggression simply because she believed in Allah Ta'ala this is a role model or you want the role model who mashallah all they care is about their lipstick and mascara and their this, you know their figure and, and what, what sort of role modeling is this this or this you choose somebody who stands firm for their convictions in Allah Ta'ala and Iman or somebody who stands firm on there how many, how many people would like their Facebook posts seriously this is what has become of us and this is where some sadly some sisters are being pulled to no my sisters you want a role model look at Sumayya and the brothers you want a role model look at Yasser and look at Ammar and look at Bilal, look at Abu Bakr, they are the role models. They are the role models, but we have forgotten about them. Seldom do we speak about them. Right? Rarely do we speak about these role models. And because they are not spoken about outside, we need to revive their lives, we need to revive their stories. You need to do that in your houses. So that your son and daughter, when they think of a role model, they think of Umar and Ammar and Yasser and Sumayya and Bilal and Aisha and Fatima. That's the role. These are the role models. These are the role models. Why? And I'll finish with this. Because as if you recall the, the, the hadith that I mentioned some time ago, Ibn Mas'ud says, مَنْ كَانَ مُسْتَنَّنْ فَلْيَسْتَنَّ بِالَّذِينَ قَدْ مَاتُوا فَإِنَّ الْحَيَّ لَتُؤْمَنُ عَلَيْهِ الْفِتْنَةِ أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. 
اختارهم الله لصحبة نبيه He says if you want to follow the life of anyone If you want to take anybody as a role model Then take the Sahaba Take, the, take those who died on Iman as your role model Because the living You cannot guarantee what will happen to them the living, you don't know. I can't take you as a role model. You can't take because I don't. You can't take me as a role model, and I can't take you as a role model because I don't know what's going to happen to you. You don't know what's going to happen to me. But we know what happened to Sumayya, and we know what happened to Ammar, and we know what happened to Yasser, and we know what happened to Bilal. Take them, he said, as your role model. That's number one. Then he says because Allah chose them to be the friends, the companions of Rasulullah sallam. They were the role models. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to understand their lives, follow their lives, and may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala allow us to take them as our role models, inshallah Ta'ala, and give us even a portion of the Iman that they had, even a, a sample of the Iman they had, inshallah Ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma asfoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.